I haven't gone to Patterson yet, but I'm going to do that next. I have to go to the bar. I went to the bar, you know. <laughs> Just take a left at the bar and go to Patterson. All right. So I think Alan is telling me that it is time to start. Oh. Uh, yes. As the host, I'm going to ask everybody, please mute, your, mute yourself other than uh, the president and Alan. And uh, it is all yours, Madam President. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. So welcome to another meeting of the Rotary Club of Livermore. And it's wonderful to see all your faces, even though I'm just seeing them in little small boxes on my uh, mo computer monitor. So I would like to, let's see, Don Wentz, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? And I'll ask everybody else to keep yourself on mute and uh, say the, recite the pledge along with Don. So Don, if you unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Don. Don, you're still muted. Okay, we're gonna do it again. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much, Don. And now we have a song uh, created by Michael and Stu. Michael's here with us today, but Stu is not. And this you'll see is related to today's speaker. Stu is up at Yos Yosemite. Um, Carl Perkins wrote the song, The Beatles Made It Famous, I think in more words than one. Can't hear it, Alan. It's a silent movie. Who's responsible for this? Alan, sound? would you like to see if we can start it again? We can't, uh, the audio is not coming through. Oh, Alan. All right, we'll give Alan a moment there. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what happened, but uh, I've been in the in the share mode, and I wasn't able to unmute myself. Ah, okay. So maybe something happened uh, there. We'll try it again now that you're unmuted and. Oh, uh, back to share mode. Back to share mode. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? I hear you. Uh, no music. Ellen, you know did what? you we can check hear the you, settings Alan, but we can't on hear your that. It might be your video? headset. Say that again about the headset. With your headset plugged in, it may just be playing to yours and not playing out on onto the speakers or on the screen. Oh, that's interesting. You can give that one a shot. You might also check your settings for your sharing that you have both boxes on the preferences at the bottom checked off, Alan. Well, I'm going to hit, uh, can you hear me speaking? Yes. Okay, I'm going to hit screen share one more time. I disconnected the headphones. And here we go. Sitting 
Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, everybody, for your patience as we are all still learning about the different uh, technology that comes with uh, meeting via Zoom. And Tom Vargas was scheduled to um, give the thought for the day, but unfortunately, at the last minute, he's not able to join us. Uh, I will share, because Tom shared with me, uh, that next month, Tom and his wife will be moving up to Idaho. Um, but he'll still be continuing to work in Pleasanton uh, remotely, so we'll still plans to be a member of our club um, while we're meeting on Zoom. So we'll go ahead and move on. He's got grandchildren up in Idaho. Smart he man. Does. He does. All right, so our meeting front line. So Jeff is again uh, doing a return appearance as our Zoom greeter and host. Uh, Christina Marianne is our Spur reporter, and we'll be hearing from her later as well. Alan Frank on AV. Don Wentz will be our publisher. Um, and uh, Glenn is our backup host, and our Zoom chat monitor is David Rounds. And I'm not remembering off the top, and our Spur reporter is also, oh, we, I already said that, Christina. All right, so thank you all. All right, so um, any visiting Rotarians, I know our speaker is a visiting Rotarian. He'll have a full introduction later, but I'd like him to say hello right now. Well, hello, everybody. And first, I I've got a lot of uh, thank you gifts and speaker gifts and things like that. A song uh, with Shelterbox, and that is a first. Uh, I'm Bill Tobin. I'll be speaking later. I'm from the Rotary Club of uh, El Dorado Hills. And sneaking in behind me is my wife, Sherry, who is uh, our immediate past president of El Dorado Hills Rotary and then uh, currently an assistant governor in District 5180. So welcome, Bill. Thank you for joining us today. Any other visiting Rotarians? All right, I know we have a guest. Uh, Pat Coyle, would you like to introduce uh, your guest? Oh, Carolyn, President Carolyn, and, and other guests and, and uh, club members, I'm just delighted that Van Rainey could join us. Uh, Paul Thompson, Bill Nebo, a number of us have known Van for a long time in a different context, a uh, men's meditation group. And it's just, uh, we, we finally said, Van, we may not have ever twisted your arm. Why don't you come to Rotary? So we invited him to come, and here he is. And in terms of Van's background, he might want to touch on that a little bit if he unmutes. Uh, I've known him through a variety of, of roles where he's consulted for companies and run his own business, done quality uh, management kinds of things. So I'm not quite sure how Van would sum that up. Um, I'm retired. There you go. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Van. <laughs> so welcome, Van. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're glad uh, that you're with us here virtually. Glad to be here. Any other uh, guests that to be introduced? All right. I don't think that we have any. So on to... Oh. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Alan. Alan decided to have a little music today uh, as you're talking about my walkabout. So here's an updated map so you can see that I am kind of reaching uh, some of the city limits 
at least at this point, uh, north, south, and east, not quite west yet. And uh, so I'm sharing a photo from a walk uh, that is appropriate. Um, so as I go, uh, appropriate for our speaker today, as we're gonna hear about shelters, one of the things that I've really uh, enjoyed doing is getting to look at all of the various shelter that we're fortunate to have here in Livermore. And I'm always drawn to all of the chairs sitting out in porches and pairs of seating for outside, especially now. And this um, particular porch drew my attention just since the chairs matched the doors. So here's the teal porch. So I just encourage you to uh, just pay attention when you're going around town and looking at the beauty that we see in the various shelter around town. All right, so I have a sad announcement to share, which many of you may already be aware of. Um, Tom Brown, a loving husband of former mayor Kathy Brown passed away. Uh, Kathy is also a friend of Livermore and Tom lost his battle with ALS. He was diagnosed with ALS in December of last year and recently passed away. So uh, if you know Kathy, extend your condolences to Kathy. I'm sure we'll have more information forthcoming. If you're an A's fan, uh, you may be aware that as part of the, if you're a baseball fan in general, part of the cutouts uh, are fans enjoying um, baseball games are done through cutouts. And the A's have a whole section dedicated to ALS cures. And that's really started by the Piscotti family um, because A's player, Stephen Piscotti, his mother uh, passed away uh, from ALS and uh, Tom Brown is one of those cutouts. So if you ever see that section during an A's game, Tom is in the second row middle of that section. So um, I, we extend our condolences to Kathy and the rest of Tom's family. So up next, uh, Christina Marion is doing double duty today. So Christina, you are up to give your a uh, new member talk. Is Christina here? Hey, Carolyn, I don't see her in, in the list of participants. Okay, so she may have had, uh, as we'll get her rescheduled. So, um, as you know. Oh, wait, she's just, no, she's just coming in now. Sorry, she okay. was. She was just, just joined the waiting room. Okay. Oh, look, she there's me. Had a cat emergency. <laughs> Welcome, Christina. Hi. Hi, Carolyn. Good. We're ready for you to give your uh, new member talk. And I do recommend that um, people put there, if you know how to do this, put your view on speaker view while um, Christina is sharing with us uh, a little bit of her background. Are you ready, Christina? I, I am ready. Okay. Sure. All right. So, um, uh, I, I, Christina Marion, so I joined Rotary through my husband, John Marion, who comes from a long line of John Marion Rotarians. Um, I was born in Santiago, Chile. Uh, US, so technically I'm a US citizen born abroad. Uh, I was only six months old uh, when my family moved back from Chile. Uh, and then from the ages of five to seven, I also lived in Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, which was kind of an interesting childhood. So I loved uh, tide pooling. We, we used to always go to a beach. It was called Sambolo, um, kind of in the, you could see the, the remnants of Krakatau in the distance and loved scaring my mom with sea cucumbers was always really really fun uh and then for high school uh kind of divided between sf bay area and la uh so i started high school up here in northern california my family moved down to la when i was a sophomore um but pretty much even though i i lived in other places just very very californian <laughs> that's kind of where where i've mostly been 
Um, I came back up to UC Berkeley for my undergraduate education. So I graduated there with a double major in biology and English. Uh, so kind of both, both sides. I had a double major. And then I finished my veterinary school education. I graduated from UC Davis uh, with my DVM degree in 2011, which actually I got married one week before I graduated. And then um, uh, basically, yeah, got married and then graduated. And then I went down to San Diego for a year and lived apart from John for a whole year <laughs> for my internship, which was not a very good year. Uh, but learned a lot and then came back. I worked emergency in downtown Berkeley until about this time last year. And then now I'm currently working as an emergency veterinarian and uh, medical director. We're opening several hospitals for my new company. It's called a Veterinary Emergency Group. So all we do is emergency, which is why we say we do it best. We're just ER doctors there when you need us most. And uh, we're going to be opening several and I've been traveling. I, I sure picked a good time to travel. Uh, so I worked in, um, I have my veterinary license in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, Florida, Colorado, uh, obviously California too. And so I was working in New York in December and New Jersey in January and uh, did some training in New York in February. And then of course was supposed to work in New York and, and COVID really, kind of changed the plan. So I started doing a lot of uh, telemedicine for my company. So I help answer medical questions for people remotely through the company. And that's been a, a very cool thing to be a part of, just kind of talking to people, triaging, uh, helping, helping people with their pets when they need it most. And that's kind of what I love to do. So, but looking forward to being here in the Bay Area. We, uh, we've got our lease uh, I will soon be able to disclose the locations that we're looking at, uh, but love being a veterinarian. And um, aside from that, uh, my wonderful husband, John, who makes delicious, delicious wine, and my son, Jude, turned six in April. Uh, he had a COVID birthday, and he also, you know, maybe someday he'll, he'll be a Rotarian as well. Be the, he is the fourth John Marion, so his, we call him Jude. That's kind of a nickname, uh, even though it's, it's what he goes by. Uh, but he is John Lewis Marion IV. <laughs> so, and that's me. I'm so excited to be a part of Rotary. Thank you very much, Christina. And uh, welcome to Livermore. We're glad that you have your roots here and that John, uh, his roots run deep here. And we're glad that uh, yours will. Too. Roots run deep. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, and up next, uh, Pat McMiniman, you have some recognitions to do uh, for uh, generous giving to the Rotary International Foundation. Yes, uh, thank you, President Carolyn, fellow Rotarians and guests. Today our club is recognizing four of our members for their very generous giving to the Rotary Foundation of Rotary International. First on the recognition list here is James Goodhart. James is receiving Paul Harris Fellow recognition for the first time today and has received a recognition certificate and his first Paul Harris Fellow pen from the Rotary Foundation of RI. Yesterday I had the honor of presenting recognition items to James and James shared that his donation to the Rotary Foundation was in honor of his parents. So please join me as we Congratulate James on becoming a Paul Harris Fellow. And uh, Jeff Youngsma is our next recipient of Rotary Foundation recognition. Jeff is also receiving Paul Harris Fellow recognition for the first time today. And he's also received a recognition certificate and pen from the Rotary Foundation of RI. I also had an opportunity to take uh, a photo of Jeff on my front porch yesterday, and uh, you can see his certificate open there. I uh, enjoyed giving the recognition items to Jeff directly there yesterday. And Alan Burnham is receiving his Paul Harris Fellow Plus Two pen. And um, you'll see a new development here that Alan Frank came up with just yesterday. Under Alan Burnham's name, you'll see three rotary wheels. 
And for each thousand dollars that Alan has given, there's a corresponding rotary wheel. So Alan Burnham is Paul Harris fellow plus two, but his initial thousand dollars bumped him up to three rotary wheels here. The same is going on for Dale Miller. Dale Miller is receiving his Paul Harris fellow plus six pin today and has donated $7,000. Just want to say that with Alan Burnham, he's been a Paul Harris Fellow since 2018 and a very generous donor to the Rotary Foundation during the past three years. Uh, Dr. Dale Miller is, um, in addition to being a Paul Harris Fellow, plus six, is also a Paul Harris Society member. And along with that comes the de dedication to give generously annually as a Paul Harris Society member. So thank you all of our recipients today for your generosity to the Rotary Foundation and all that you do to provide uh, and support Rotary's programs, both locally and internationally. Back to you, Carolyn. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, and thank you to Jeff, James, Alan and Dale. So I have some exciting news as fellow Rotarians in case that you haven't heard this news already. And that is uh, Rotary is making history. And as um, in that Jennifer Jones has been nominated to be the president nominee for Rotary International. So this is the first woman nominated for that role. And if nobody else um, has, if there's no other candidate that's put forth as of October 1st, then she'll become the president nominee for um, Rotary International. And a little bit later, I can put that link into the chat. So just thought you should be all aware of that exciting news and development for Rotary. Uh, also, so now I would like to invite uh, Dennis O'Brien to make an announcement about our involvement with the Veterans First program at Las Positas College. Greetings Rotarians. Uh, last year, a number of us um, uh, from our club and a few people from the Morning Club um, had a workshop over in Las Positas College for student veterans to go through resumes and um, uh, go through an interviewing workshop. Uh, it was very successful and now Las Positas Veterans First program has asked us to do it again. Last year, Jacob Reed and Gordon Jones, Tim Berry and J.R. Romero all joined us and a few people from the Morning Club and uh, it turned out pretty well. Uh, I've gotten in touch with Beth McCormick of the Morning Club and they're willing to go in it with us again uh, this year. So it's scheduled for October 27th, and I'll be getting in touch with a couple of people with uh, experienced hiring managers um, background uh, and see what we can do, put together a program. Uh, so stay tuned. And if anybody has any ideas or, or thoughts about it, get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dennis. Um, I also wanted to let you know that the Rotary Club of Livermore is a member of the Livermore Chamber of Commerce, and therefore, as such, you are all welcome to attend any of the uh, chamber functions. So if you go on the Livermore Chamber, Livermore Valley Chamber of Commerce website, you're welcome to participate in their events. Uh, they're doing all of their events virtual as well. Uh, those will include like, for example, on Friday, they're doing a joint event with the other chambers in the Tri-Valley to hear from uh, Dr. Moss, uh, Alameda County Health Department uh, Interim Director, in later this month, Scott Haggerty will be um, doing his state of the county address. That's a paid event. So it's a combination of paid and free events. So if you're looking for something more to do and staying connected with uh, our Valley and our city, check out the Livermore Chambers website. And then I'd also like to say thank you as of this morning to who have uh, completed the club survey. 
thank you very much for that. And just to ask that the rest of you uh, complete your surveys by the end of the month, or excuse me, by Saturday, not the end of the month, by Saturday. So thank you Alan, very much for that. Yes, Alan. Could we have the link to the survey sent out again to all the members? Um, yes, we can, and I will put that in the chat. So David, I will ask uh, if you'll do that. So that means you have to read your emails that David sends out. Okay, next week our presentation will be by one of our fellow members. Uh, Bob Jacobs will be giving a presentation on mediation, kind of the benefits and the process. And I hope I have that right title because I assigned that to Bob. All right. And uh, up next is uh, Barbara Hickman with us. Uh, Barbara was, so Barbara, I think was going to want it, has been involved with Shelterbox and she was going to do an introduction, but potentially wasn't going to join us. So I will uh, introduce our speaker. So uh, as Bill mentioned, he is a member of the Rotary Club of El Dorado Hills, California. Um, he has served in several club and district leadership roles and is also a major donor to the uh, Rotary Foundation. In 2016-17, he was Rotary District 5180, uh, the Rotary District 5180, awarded Bill Rotarian of the Year for his active and dedicated service to Rotary and for his commitment to Shelterbox. Bill began as a volunteer for Shelterbox after the two 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Since then, he has shared the Shelterbox story with thousands of Rotarians, organized fundraiser and awareness events for Shelterbox USA, and helped lead the team of USA ambassadors in raising over $1.4 million for Shelterbox in 2017. For his volunteer efforts with Shelterbox, Bill has received the United States Presidential Volunteer Service Award seven times. After a 30-year career as a nuclear power plant inspector, Bill earned a certificate in nonprofit management from the University of Pacific and joined the staff at Shelterbox USA as a Rotary Relation Manager in January of 2019. As Bill introduced her to us, Bill is married to Sherry, his wife, and they've been married for 36 years. She's an assistant governor in District 5180. They have two sons and a daughter-in-law. So Bill, welcome. Thank you, President Carolyn, and uh, hello, Livermore. Uh, yes, uh, full disclosure, I was Rotarian of the Year, uh, but my wife, Sherry, she was honored with that the year before me. So uh, she set the bar very high. I barely scraped the even with it. I would never be over the bar when it comes to my wife. She's incredible and standing behind me, so I better say that. Uh, let's get on with the show. I, I am going to uh, share with you, hopefully, here, if I do everything correctly, and that, and then that, and that should be a full screen for everybody. If not, uh, please speak up and let me know that you can't see it, and I'll do my best to fix that. Shelterbox, uh, we're really celebrating a 20-year a uh, anniversary this year, and that's kind of strange and because everything this year is kind of strange, uh, but we were founded by a Rotary Club 20 years ago, a club in England in the very southwest corner of the country in Cornwall, uh, where basically if you go any further south or west, you're going to get wet. Uh, they had a couple of members who had some sort of inclination and some expertise in what it would take to do disaster relief, and lo and behold, Shelterbox was born. It quite quickly became much larger of an endeavor than a Rotary Club of volunteers could, could handle uh, internally, so it became a United Kingdom Trust, which is their version of what we would call a nonprofit, and then Shelterbox USA came around a couple of years later uh, with much the same thing. We had a lot of people who wanted to donate their time and, the, and learn to be a response team member. Uh, and and we, we wanted to make sure that people got the uh, tax credits and whatnot for those donations. So Shelterbox USA was formed. In 2012, uh, it became so popular amongst Rotary clubs around the world that Rotary International themselves said, hey, we need to form an official partnership uh, for global disaster relief and we would like you to be our partners. And uh, so since 2012, uh, we have been official 
Rotary International partners, not just some club project that's gone viral around the world. Uh, that being said, though, we are, we are independent of Rotary International. We have our own management and our own staff. Uh, we're operated independently and we're funded outside of the Rotary Foundation. Uh, I'm a major donor of the foundation, a past polio plus chair in my district. I love the Rotary Foundation, but I also know that my donations to the Rotary Foundation do not make it to shelter box. So for those of you, especially a new member, uh, great talk, by the way, I really enjoyed that. Uh, that's, that's the way you start out a Rotary membership right there. You let people know all about you. There's no better way to become a Rotarian than the, to put yourself out there amongst other Rotarians. Uh, and, and for Shelterbox, uh, if you're new, uh, you may, even if you've known about us for a long time, you might think we only have one tent and we only do things one way, the way it, you heard about it in 2005 or 2010. And we've really evolved quite a bit as an organization. We have a, a lot of different types of tents that we could send. Uh, some are very specific for weather conditions. Some are very generic because you may not want, uh, even as prestigious and uh, peace oriented as the name of Rotary International and the name of Shelterbox, uh, both are sometimes it's wiser not to put any logos on the tent, depending on where we're going in the world. Uh, there's a lot of other gear as well, pots and pans, uh, saws and tools, mosquito nets, water filters, uh, solar lights. We, we've been doing solar lights now for a number of years. Uh, one of the most precious items actually is our Luminate solar light. It brings light after the sun goes down. And, you know, we've all had small periods of not having electricity at night, and we're always looking for candles and flashlights uh, I would highly recommend Illuminate solar light in your, uh, in your house. I use them here all the time. In 2015, we rolled out what's called a shelter kit. Uh, that is a tarpaulin based shelter. So families can use locally sourced materials. Sometimes we can provide those. Uh, other times they are available elsewhere. Uh, they can then construct their own shelters with tarps. Uh, the advantage of this is uh, it could be a much larger sh uh, shelter than our tents are capable of creating. And tarps also have a number of different uses. Uh, when you've rebuilt your home, uh, you could use those tarps for harvesting crops, for adding on to your home, for covering your livestock. Uh, whereas a tent, well, I won't say they aren't uh, used the second or third time. I've seen a lot of cases where our tents are reused, uh, as small businesses even. Uh, but uh, a tarp really has its advantages over a tent. Now, this is Grace and her family after Cyclone Adai last year in Malawi. Uh, we responded, helped about 3,000 families, and you can see what a, a shelter kit can accomplish here. And the shelter kit also really expanded the beneficiary base for us as people can need a, a, a repairs to their home. Uh, there was a day in our history where we would have bypassed this house because it was at least still standing. It didn't have walls or roof, uh, but it was there, and we were looking for the most desperate people whose houses were completely destroyed. Now we can cater to all the families that we could reach uh, and, and really give them a sense to, of a place they could reconstruct and, and call home again and put their curtains up and have their hanging flower pots out front. We do want to always be considered a, a temporary solution. Uh, we don't want someone living in tarp-based shelter or tents for uh, here until the, the end of their days. Uh, but where we operate, uh, there's a good chance they'll be in the tents or tarp-based shelters for at least six to nine months. Uh, and sometimes up into the multiple of years. Uh, we've had people living in a tented shelter now for several years uh, in refugee camps. So some of our uh, big notable deployments over the year, uh, you know, initially the, the very first goal of the Helston Lizard Club in this project called Shelterbox was to help 10 families a year. Uh, and uh, that would have been really cool. I mean, uh, my club would have loved that. You know, what a, that would have been a nice uh, addition to your international service projects. No doubt about that. Uh, but we did learn real quick also that there was a great need out there. And so the need was growing and growing. And uh, a big notable benchmark in our growth was the Indian Ocean tsunami. And we helped over 22,000 families across four countries uh, in 2005. It was the tsunami struck on Boxing Day the day after Christmas. So this is, says 2004, the time of the disaster, but the actual deployment went into the first quarter uh, and even a little bit beyond into in 2005. I first learned about Shelterbox. Uh, I was president-elect, so Carolyn, you were just like that a few months ago uh, in 2010. I was also our high school's interact advisor. I was doing the last year of that before I had to uh, leave that to someone else so I could be president and Haiti earthquake struck. And the interactors actually came to me and said, Mr. Tobin, what should we do, what should we do? 
I'd never heard of shelter box. So I said, why don't you research rotary and disaster relief and, you know, see what comes up? Because I always wanted to point them towards things that rotary does. Well, lo and behold, a couple hours later, they, they introduced me to shelter box. And as you heard in my intro, it's completely changed uh, who I am. Uh, my focus in, in rotary, my focus outside of rotary, uh, shelter boxes there. I, I, those kids raised a thousand dollars. Our club matched a thousand. Uh, I then as a president elect, as any good president elect would do, uh, challenged all the other president elects in 5180 and we raised over 20 grand. Uh, we helped over 33,000 families in Haiti. And to this day, that's still our largest response to a natural disaster. Uh, what a lot of Rotarians don't realize is the amount of work that we do in uh, conflict situations. People displaced either internally to a country or leaving the country and becoming refugees uh, due to terrorist activity or war. Uh, we've been responding in and around Syria since fall of 2012. We've been there almost eight years in these countries, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Iraq, uh, Turkey, even as far away as Greece and Italy and in Syria itself. Uh, we've helped over 60,000 families now uh, who have been displaced due to the conflict in Syria. So that's, uh, that's a brief overlook at 20 years. Uh, 1.5 million people uh, sheltered, over 300 responses. Uh, there's still a great need in the world. Uh, we just this year topped 100 million people displaced due to uh, natural disasters and conflict. And that adds up everybody. Uh, that's uh, Someone mentioned paradise earlier. This would include the people who are still displaced uh, from what they consider a permanent house uh, of something like paradise. It would also include people displaced by hurricanes uh, uh, here in America or North America uh, in the Caribbean, but it also natural disasters includes everybody worldwide. So 25 million people roughly, that's kind of within the expected norm uh, when you look at natural disasters globally. That number with conflict though at nearly 80 million people, that's a sum greater than those displaced by World War I and II combined. Uh, it's an incredible amount of people and it's growing. That number's gone up quite a bit in the last couple of years. Uh, kind of weird to think about it that way because we don't consider ourselves really at, at war, um, but the, it's just a, a global population is so great now that the, it doesn't take a global conflict to displace uh, nearly 80 million people. So this partnership in, in action, well, I mean, it's been nothing but a partnership in action for Shelterbox, having been started by a Rotary Club. Uh, obviously, funding has a lot to do with it. Our very first dollars came out of Rotarians' pocketbooks and clubs' uh, budgets. Uh, oh, by the way, there's a picture of Jennifer Jones right there. She's a big fan of Shelterbox, and uh, actually, she has a niece up in Canada. She's from uh, Ontario. Uh, her niece is one of our ambassadors up there, so uh, it's great to see her becoming the first of uh, female president for Rotary. I can't think of a better choice myself. Uh, uh, outside of Rotary though, we have grown quite a bit in our fundraising. So uh, a testament to Rotarians sharing uh, what we do to people outside of Rotary. Uh, it's a big, big help. And, and a good way to get more involved with us is volunteering. Uh, this is actually from February. Uh, yeah, we got in and out of Las Vegas before the shutdown and nobody in this picture got sick or got Corona at least. There may have been a few hangovers, but no one got Corona from being in Las Vegas. So we were very fortunate uh, but it just illustrates the great volunteer base that we have. And, and I'd love to have more volunteers down in 5170. You have such a great district. Your Interact is uh, absolutely the best in the world, in my opinion. You had some of the top foundation giving. Your membership numbers are good. Boy, it's, it's, you're ripe for a great shelter box team. There was one there uh, uh, some years ago, uh, led by Keith, who was a response team member down in uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, but he's since retired from that response work. Uh, and so we really need to rebuild a team down there. Other ways that Rotary really uh, helps us out around the world is uh, Rotarians have allowed us to find uh, warehouse space around the world so we could pre-position our aid. Uh, that way it, it doesn't have to all come out of a single warehouse which was once located in the United Kingdom. Now we have gear stored uh, all over the world so we could get into the countries in Africa out of Dubai and Saudi Arabia or uh, uh, the UAE. Uh, we could get into the Caribbean through our warehouse uh, hub in uh, Panama much quicker than trying to get it across the pond from the UK. In an area of disaster, uh, well, you know, we're people of action in Rotary. So everything from importing of our gear, uh, translations, transportation. I mean, I lived in the Bay Area. Uh, I'm up in El Dorado Hills near Sacramento now, but I grew up in the Bay Area, lived there for several years. And I remember the earthquake in, in 89 and how hard it was to get it anywhere uh, around. And uh, so Rotary 
uh, when there's flooding, like in this picture, uh, they could take uh, a couple of tons worth of boxes there on those long boats in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, information, that's probably the one of the keys to makes us successful. We get a lot of that initial information from Rotary District governors and uh, Rotary clubs. Uh, if I were to come to Livermore, I, I wouldn't even know where to start looking. I know a couple good wineries down there, <laughs> but other than that, I wouldn't know where to start looking for your most vulnerable uh, segments of your population. And should a major earthquake or something, uh, knock on wood, uh, happen there, uh, I would depend on your club uh, to find uh, that first step. Uh, it's so important. Uh, another misconception I think Rotarians have about shelter boxes are size, that we have thousands of people ready to activate around the world. Uh, the reality is we have about 130 response team members uh, globally. So at any given time, we may only have 30 to 50 of those uh, able to respond to multiple disasters around the world. So we rely on those local Rotarians to really be the face of our response work. And what a level of comfort it brings to a local community that's just been through a disaster to see that it's local faces that are there helping. Uh, it's not some international aid group coming in and saying, here, take a number, we'll be there when we get there. Uh, there's that, that Rotarian um, attitude, I guess, uh, that demeanor uh, that Rotarians share around the world that really makes it successful for us. <laughs> Looking uh, at the world right now, uh, it's amazing that uh, everything has changed for us. And at the same time, absolutely nothing has changed for us. Uh, disasters still happen. Uh, all the things I just outlined are steps we have to get through uh, to reach a disaster area. Uh, the coronavirus and the lockdown around the world's really just created a whole other layer of disaster for us to mitigate through to reach the people in need. And we are uh, active all over the world right now. Uh, why, why is our activity, why is it so important for us to do what we do? Why don't we just isolate along with everyone else and wait this thing out? Uh, why would refugees or people in an evacuation center be at more risk? Well, it really boils down to population density. A, uh, a major city like Wuhan, China, that has uh, somewhere between 11 and 13 million people is nothing in density compared to a cruise ship, nothing in density compared to a refugee camp, or even a U.S. based evacuation uh, center, which is what you're looking at here. Uh, this is in Houston, and we responded after Hurricane Harvey there. And you can see here in a, a George Brown Convention Center, uh, something like the coronavirus, boy, it's going to go wall to wall, you know, in a day or two. Uh, that's why we need to do what we do. We need to get these refugees that are living in these dwellings here in Bangladesh that are multiple family dwellings. We have to be able to isolate them better. Uh, the reason being, uh, where we're operating in the world, they don't have the healthcare system we have here in the United States. Uh, and, you saw, and we're still seeing how precariously close to uh, burden those hospitals are. We had to put temporary structures up in New York uh, that FEMA and some other groups were able to uh, construct there. Uh, we're doing that same thing in the Philippines where we have already had four separate disaster responses since the early March when this global shutdown or lockdown or isolation down, whatever we're calling it these days uh, since it began. One of those responses was uh, expanding a hospital on the island of Cebu. This is our uh, warehouse in, in the Philippines in the background, but in the foreground are a couple of our shelter box Philippines uh, responders and some hospital workers, and they had to expand that hospital space. And we were able to accommodate it with structures like this one so that the hospital could accommodate 100 more patients per day. Uh, these are just tarps. These are uh, heavy duty tarps. They aren't the type that we put on our firewood and we watch it disintegrate through the summer. These are uh, construction grade uh, materials uh, and it really makes a difference there. Uh, volcanic eruption, that will certainly uh, displace people. And so this is the only time this group got this close together unless absolutely necessary. And these are Rotarians in the Philippines along with our response team members and some of our gear. That response was uh, quite a bit different because social distancing had to take place. The training is a very integral part of what we do. We wanna make sure people understand the equipment they're getting and how to build things like shelter. Uh, normally that's done in a group setting and like a rotary meeting when we're all together, it's really easy to share ideas and best practices to learn. Uh, not so easy when we're isolated. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the post distribution reporting uh, brings back to see how well people understood the gear in this style of training as opposed to group settings. Uh, in Africa, uh, no matter where we go, uh, it's a whole new world, but we still have to reach these families uh, because they are displaced uh, due to conflict or due to uh, natural disasters. 
Uh, even in Syria, this young lady here is in Syria, and we've included soap and wash basins now uh, in our gear so that uh, uh, we could help stop the spread of this uh, virus. Where we are right now, it's really no different than this picture or the last. Uh, uh, we're in a tent. Each one of us is in our own home. It's absolutely no different than us being in a tent here. Everyone on this call, all 57 or something like that, and great turnout, by the way, uh, for Zoom, Carolyn. That's fantastic. There's probably 57 tents here. We're in 57 different locations. Uh, it's exactly the way we need to operate in our relief efforts around the world. Uh, one area, Lake Chad Basin, has been uh, near and dear to us because it has so many complex levels of disaster going on there. You've got terrorism that's displaced two and a half million people. You have an ecological disaster where Lake Chad over the last uh, 45 years or uh, almost 50 years now has virtually disappeared. You have mass displacement of people due to these two regions, uh, reasons, and now you have COVID-19 on top of things. The Minnewau camp is in Cameroon. It's one of several that we help outfit around all four countries around Lake Chad. It's got close to 70,000 people there. We need to build it out to 100,000 people. There are 20,000 people waiting to get in outside the camp where life is much more dangerous than inside the camp. Minnewau is so big, you can see it from Google Maps. You go online this afternoon and do a search on Minnewau and you'll see the same picture. Uh, the only addition I added was the uh, little red circle. And as we zoom in on that little red circle, I'll let you know we are the only supplier of tents to 70,000 people. And that's what 50 families looks like. That's good social separation right there. Uh, that's not gonna be transmitting uh, COVID between families there. Now this picture, uh, don't, <laughs> don't get the wrong look. Uh, this, this is from last fall. So this was before coronavirus. We would not be uh, having families uh, this close together as you see here, but I wanna point out a couple things. One of these are some of the most desperate people on earth in Rotary and Shelter Box and several other organizations that make uh, refugee camps operate. Uh, we're, we're getting the work done. Second, you're gonna notice that this is almost all female. And you'd be absolutely right. Minowa has over 80% women and girls in their population. Women like Esther, she's a long-term resident of the camp, but when she first arrived in 2016, uh, she shared a harrowing story that has since been shared by dozens and dozens and dozens. Uh, I, I would dare say hundreds of women uh, that come to Minowau. Uh, she was uh, enjoying an evening with her three older brothers, her mom and dad, and her little brother in their village, and Boko Haram raided that village. Before they could leave with just the clothes on their backs and whatever they could grab, uh, those uh, terrorists entered their, their hut, uh, killed the three older brothers and father instantly, uh, raped and murdered her mother, found her little brother for slavery, and then he told Esther to run. Esther was used as target practice um, by militia members uh, and by previously kidnapped children, boys, uh, that are conscripted into the uh, Boko Haram ranks uh, uh, through fear and intimidation. And so they were out waiting with sticks, with stones, with anything at their disposal to attack people who were running. Well, uh, Esther's not, that's, uh, uh, it's a horrible story, but it, it does have a somewhat of a silver lining. Um, over the years, it did take some time for her to adapt to uh, a new life, a new, a new reality, a new normal. Um, she learned how to sew. Uh, she's very good at it. She's actually a seamstress. She has a business. And you might think, you know, especially as so many business owners here in Rotary, you think, oh, how? A business in a refugee camp? Oh, of course. The last thing people want to be told is to just sit and do nothing. You know how hard it is on us to do this isolation thing. Uh, everyone wants to be a productive member in their society. I truly believe that. And we've been able to do case study with Esther. And her quote is that anytime she sees someone wearing something that she sews, it makes her happy. That says something right there. And, and uh, Shelter Box and Rotary, we can't take 100% claim on, on her uh, success story here. But we are the... Uh, the shadows here that, that give her shadow in the middle of the day, uh, where the blankets that keep her warm, uh, where the water filters uh, that keep her from getting sick and her babies from getting sick from water. In Minnewau, there is filtered water, but there's often long lines for that water. And if you've lived your entire life uh, just relying on groundwater, you'd be very likely just to go drink groundwater and avoid the line, and it happens. We can't police 70,000 people. We don't even try, uh, not in that type of uh, regard. Uh, but we can do things like 
gravity fed water filters. So the families like Shemaya and his wife and children here, uh, if they decide to drink brown water, uh, they can now filter that water and make sure that they don't get sick. Everywhere we go, we do what's called meal. Uh, it's post distribution monitoring. Uh, I suggest every Rotary Club does this uh, on every service project. You go back to the people you serve, you, you, you devise a good set of questions that will get good feedback that you could evaluate, you count on, on your on how well did you do, and you learn on how you could do things better. Every time we get 100% on something, it's not very often, but it really makes us question was the, was the question phrased correctly. You know, it raises some red flags, uh, but we have uh, done numerous different questions uh, regarding family privacy in Minnewau, and each one comes back 100%. Uh, last uh, few minutes, I want to talk about Syria. Uh, there's still a war going on there. Uh, corona hasn't stopped it. There's no rotary in Syria. Uh, that's something a lot of people don't realize. Uh, there was from the mid-30s through the mid-60s, so it has been quite some time uh, since uh, rotary existed in Syria. There are some uh, agencies and some social service groups that uh, if there was Rotary, uh, they'd be your Rotarians. We are active uh, right now in Syria. We have several projects going on up in the Idlib region where uh, over 1 million people have been displaced over the last 18 months. This is Um and her family. We're gearing up right now for the 2020 winter relief package. This is a picture from last year's winter relief package. Over three dozen kids froze to death uh, in Idlib last winter. People think Syria and they think it sounds like a nice warm climate. Uh, but it, it gets cold. It gets uh, below freezing cold in the wintertime uh, overnight, uh, sometimes even through most of the day in Idlib. So uh, Um and her family had nothing but the clothes on their backs. They didn't even have those blankets of which those twin babies are wrapped in. Everything in this picture was a result of our winter aid package last year, uh, including uh, what's not shown here. They must be over in the other corner, uh, coats for those kids. Uh, we do toddler onesies and we do uh, coats for the kids. Uh, we can't, uh, I'd love to say we could do a, a, a coat drive, um, but the import laws don't make that possible in Syria. Uh, so we have to locally source it, um, which it has its good uh, aspects as well, either in Syria uh, or in Turkey. We were able to help Um and families like her last year uh, for a little over $300 per family with all everything you see here delivered to those families. So uh, in conclusion, as I mentioned, I'm a huge fan of the Rotary Foundation, major donor, so is my wife. Uh, we just love it. Uh, we're so proud uh, to be 100% in the Charity Navigator rating. That's incredible. Um, Shelterbox doesn't get funding that way. We have to get our own funding. Uh, we are Charity Navigator rated. We are also four stars, uh, so we're very proud of that. You can see our impact in another thing I love about Rotary, and that's the Rotarian. That is a fabulous magazine. If you just get it out of your mailbox, put it on your table and leave it, shame on you. You should be reading that each month. It's fabulous. Uh, you can see stories about Shelterbox in there on occasion, but I think our impact in the world has been best measured by having been notified that we were Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize nominees for 2018 and 2019 for our work with refugees. Uh, so with that, uh, Carolyn, thank you very much. Thank you, Livermore uh, Rotary, for having me here today. Uh, I will send out an uh, email to you with all the slides I just showed. So if folks couldn't be here today, it'll be a PDF, so you could, it won't be massive. You could send it to them, along with a bunch of links for more information. Uh, if there's time for questions, uh, I'd love to take them. Thanks once again uh, for having me. Very much, Phil. We actually do have a question, everybody. We're going to use the raise your hand function, but I'm going to start with a, uh, the first question that came in the chat box from Glenn and is, can a neighborhood buy some boxes or shelters in advance to store locally in case of an earthquake or other disaster? Uh, risk reduction, uh, that, that is a, a very important aspect of what we do. Um, the short answer is no, you can't buy a shelter box. Uh, you can't, uh, uh, it's not a product, it's, it's a service. So um, that being said, a great thing that Rotary Clubs can do is become involved in disaster preparedness, and you can certainly take a page, and I'd be happy to copy all the information I can uh, on all the stuff that we get. Uh, things like a gravity-fed uh, water filter for people in the Bay Area. Everyone knows where there's a, some sort of water resource. Um, you don't want to get sick. You can't trust tap water after an earthquake, uh, but you also don't want to lug 100 pounds of water around if you have to go somewhere. So something like a water filter is a good addition. Uh, but short answer, no, we, we don't do uh, that type of uh, delivery. 
Okay. And then uh, Pat Coyle, I'll have you ask your question, or let me ask you one more question. Uh, what was your uh, 2019 budget? And well, this said, what was your fraction from Rotary International versus uh, people? But you said you don't get money directly from Rotary International. Just talk about uh, the size of your budget. Okay, uh, globally, I believe last year, we were managed on about $17 million. Uh, there's actually a link in what I'll send you to last year's annual report. So you get all the financial stuff you want out of there. Um, this year, uh, currently, we are just under $7 million, uh, U.S., which is really good for us considering uh, it is difficult right now because there's a lot of, uh, uh, well, especially within Rotary, a lot of lost revenues. We aren't able to do fundraisers. Uh, so we've really relied a lot on the individual Rotarians. And I think that's mainly what the second part of that question was about, where, you know, historically, the funding coming from Rotary clubs or Rotary as Rotarians was nearly 100%. Uh, now, domestically, it's down to about 10%. It's good and it's bad. It's bad because the amount of money isn't really increasing. We're kind of flat and be better positioned globally for the next disaster. We would like to increase that. Uh, but it's good in the fact that we've really stretched beyond the Rotary Club. And as a Rotarian in a club, I know that we are asked for money in several different ways. So we make sure we budget some uh, for shelter box, um, but we certainly couldn't rely on every club to be able to do that. So the fact that I talk about shelter box to my neighbors, uh, the people at our events, we, we try and put a tent up when we can at our events and things like that helps us grow uh, that revenue beyond the Rotary Clubs. All right, thank you, Bill. Uh, Pat Coyle, you had your hand virtually raised. Yes, Bill, thank you so much for just an excellent talk. I really thought the images were powerful. My, my two questions were one, how you uh, tailor the contents of what you deliver to the specific circumstance, one, and two, given the high densities that you face, how you deal with supporting infrastructure, the usual wash stuff, uh, maybe could be, I, I know the solar powered lights are popular, but are there also uh, microgrids or other approaches in some of the camps, uh, communication, some of that infrastructure? Okay, uh, what was the first part again? I just wrote how you tailor uh, or if oh, yeah, you tailor okay. the, so, the kits for the specifics. Yeah, so uh, there was a time in our history when we first prepositioned aid, it, we'd put it all in the box, you know, that, that generic box that you see if you've ever seen our gear. Now we palletize it, so you'll have empty boxes, you'll have shelter kits, you'll have uh, a cook sets, you'll have the solar lights, you'll have water filters. So that some of that initial response work is the coordinative effort between other organizations, which kind of gets into the second part of your question as well. Uh, when we, uh, once we were more like, um, I don't know, standalone cowboys or something, we just went and got it done. After that tsunami response in 2004, we learned and were invited to be part of a much more global group through the UN. Uh, so when those other items uh, like wash uh, materials, um, like solar power grids. Um, there are other organizations that we work with. Uh, we aren't the only people there. Uh, very rarely are we even among two or three organizations. Typically it's 10 to 12. Uh, in some cases, as many as 50 or 80 different aid agencies uh, that respond to disasters. So a lot of that initial uh, like first week worth of work because uh, we have been on the ground in a matter of days but most cases, it's, it's more in a, a week or two, or even three or four. Um, that's just the sad reality. Uh, search and rescue always comes first, and that takes a lot of time. And then finding the needs is the second thing. Uh, if we learn that there is an abundance of tarps already on its way, it may sway our decision of whether or not we're needed. Uh, uh, and, uh, but not being a part of a larger group of disaster uh, relief organizations um, like Habitat for Humanity, for example. Uh, we partner with them all over the place because it makes good sense. Uh, we do that immediate. Here's your shelter that you need right now. They're getting all that information then. And then six or eight months later, uh, depending on scheduling and the recovery rate in that area, Habitat's right back there building a house. Uh, so that partnership with other aid organizations um, really fills a lot of those uh, gaps of questions like you asked, like what about this, what about that? Um, we're capable of doing a lot and we're always looking at what else might be needed. And we saw that with soap and wash basins uh, recently that we're supplying stuff nobody else was supplying those. So we got our supply chain geared up and now we're able to do that. Thank you. 
All right, any, uh, let's see, so Brian, you have a question. You're raising your hand in person. Got to unmute first. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, exposition. I thought it was uh, very important. Uh, I was just wanting to make a couple of comments, uh, really, to our club members. Um, there have been at least uh, two or maybe three uh, disasters, the uh, Indian tsunami, Haiti, uh, Fukushima disaster, in which the, our club has uh, basically passed the hat and we've been able to purchase, uh, I think, up to five boxes on one occasion. And uh, I feel this is something, uh, a, a real partnership. And one of the things that Susan and I have done, uh, instead of just giving suddenly in response to a, a disaster, uh, we've become a monthly uh, sustainers of shelter box. And I really would urge uh, some of our other members in the club to think in those terms also. Anyway, thank you very much, Bill. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for being a monthly donor. Uh, that that really, I mean, that's what it, it takes uh, is that little bit. The, it's um, how do I put this? It's better to be um, proactive than than reactive. And the more proactive you are prior to a disaster striking, uh, the more efficient you will be in reacting to the relief efforts there. I don't know if you've got a, a pin yet, Brian, but we do for twenty dollars a month or more. Uh, we just this last, uh, I think, six months, uh, we now have a special, you know how Rotarians are with our pins. Uh, we have a special pin. Uh, so I'll make sure and uh, uh, get your uh, get Carolyn to get me your, your email and make sure you get one of our, our, our uh, monthly donor pins. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bill. And thank you, Brian, for that endorsement. I think uh, your philanthropy says a lot in terms of your endorsement of Shelterbox and its work. So we will share information that you send, Bill, with all of our club members. Uh, this concludes another Rotary Club of Livermore meeting. And I thank you all again for joining us, as Bill said, from your own various tents uh, throughout Livermore and beyond. And thanks again, Bill, for joining us today. Thank you, everybody.